Hello, everyone, and welcome to another one of our Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, PBBI from Fresno State Lecture and Conference Series for the fall of 2021. Uh, we are very excited about this presentation, and uh, we uh, are uh, thankful that uh, this was actually, as uh, some of you who follow all of the PBBI events know, we were actually uh, scheduled for last month, but uh, had something happen, a death in my family. And so uh, I want to thank Mike for understanding and for allowing us to reschedule it today. So we are the presentation, as you can see, that uh, is uh, basically the title that we have given to it here at the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute is the Portuguese in Southern Marin County. And a little bit about Mike uh, Moyle. He is uh, he lives in Sausalito, beautiful Sausalito, uh, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. A wonderful place to visit, a wonderful place to stroll, a wonderful place to see uh, the city from another angle. Um, has lived there for over 40 years. He was born on a sugar plantation on the big island of Hawaii, where he first encountered Portuguese culture and traditions. He went on to become a partner in an international law firm specializing in U.S. and J Japanese business transactions. Uh, when he retired from his legal practice, uh, Mike became involved with the Sausalitos Initiative to create a sister city relationship with Kashkaish, just outside of Lisbon, another beautiful place, uh, which was successfully concluded in 2013. And through that project, he became increasingly interested in the rich history of the Portuguese community in Southern Marin and undertook in 2014 to create the Sausalito Portuguese Walking Tour on behalf of the, uh, the IDESST. Um, okay. Lots of IDSs throughout California and uh, the Sausalito Portuguese Cultural Center. Um, and uh, we can actually post uh, some information about that for our uh, those who follow all of the PVBI events. Since then, Mike has continued his research into the Marin's Portuguese history and has shared much of his work in weekly history posts on the IDESST uh, Facebook page. So check that out. And that history is intertwined with the history of the dairy industry in Marin. And Mike is now also involved with the uh, Dare, Marin Dairy Project and seeks to identify all of the dairies that ever operated in Marin County, uh, something very dear to the San Joaquin Valley here, where there's still a few of them. Um, to date, they have found almost 400, that's amazing, 400 dairies including many that were operated by Portuguese Americans. Mike has spoken frequently to a variety of groups about Marin's Portuguese and dairy history, including to local elementary schools. That is so important, uh, where he typically combines his talks with tasting of Nine Island uh, Bakery's uh, sweet bread and the San Jorge cheese from the famous Joe Matus Cheese Company. Online, we cannot provide either one, but Mike's talk <laughs> will not need that uh, because I think everyone will be enthused uh, and uh, if it were present and we hope once we are allowed to go back in person, we hope to have Mike come to Fresno State and actually do a presentation live uh, uh, around this same thing. The invitation already stands. So uh, we hope that you can make it. We hope that these uh, in-person events will probably begin somewhere in the fall of 2022. Again, Mike, thank you so much for uh, changing it. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of the Fresno State PBBI uh, Fall Lecture and Conference Series. Welcome to Fresno virtually, and uh, we are honored to have you here today. Well, thank you, Dennis. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank we appreciate uh, the opportunity to share a little bit about uh, the history of the Sausalito and Southern Marin area. Well, now you got me hungry with this talk of food, and I had also had an opportunity to listen to the Portuguese American Hour uh, this afternoon, talking about São Martinho and all of the uh, delicious roast chestnuts that we really should be eating today. But um, we're going to talk about uh, Southern Marin history uh, today, and specifically that of the Portuguese uh, American community here. Uh, looking at the screen here, this is the, the Sausalito Portuguese Cultural Center on Caledonia Street here in Sausalito. Uh, I hope that uh, any of you who have not had the opportunity to visit will have the chance to do so uh, in the future. Um, as Denise said, I got my start uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii 
where my father worked on a sugar plantation called the Pepeekeo uh, plantation on the Hamakua coast. And so uh, you can see there at a very early age, I was already introduced to the ukulele, uh, which had been introduced by Mr. Manuel Nunes from Madeira uh, to Hawaii. And of course, it's become one of the iconic uh, instruments of the world today. But uh, certainly um, a lot of elements of Portuguese culture, including, of course, food. Uh, I grew up with a lot of malasadas and Portuguese sweetbread and linguiça. So um, it was a wonderful childhood and good preparation uh, for learning a little bit more about Portugal later in life. Uh, I've often just thought in general that it's uh, interesting the perspectives that we have coming from an island uh, that is far away from a political center. Um, and also these are these uh, map of the Hawaiian Islands and the Azores to scale. Um, so it's interesting about just about how uh, how similar they are in terms of the area uh, that they cover. Although I think the Hawaiian islands are a little bit larger in general, particularly the big island where I grew up. Uh, today we're going to talk, uh, for those of you I understand, Dennis, we may have folks who are not uh, even from California who are on this uh, call. So we're going to be talking about Sausalito, which you can see on the map of Marin County here is down in the lower uh, right corner just across the Golden Gate Bridge uh, from San Francisco. Uh, Sausalito, uh, going back to the, the Mexican period of California, was originally one of the, uh, the ranchos uh, that was uh, several of which here in Marin, what is today Marin County, that were divided up uh, into uh, individual parcels and then granted to various individuals who had connections uh, with the local government. And one of those individuals was actually an Englishman named William Richardson, who had been spending some time here. And he was granted the Rancho Salcelito. And you can see it's, it's always a source of some confusion, but they used to spell it with a C, S-A-U-C-E-L-I-T-O, which I think was the Spanish spelling Salcelito apparently is intended to mean little willow tree and salce is willow in um, in Spanish, but today that's, we've uh, moved on to an SA version. So Richardson got it in the 1830s. This is uh, taking just a look at Sausalito. This is a aerial view at the very top uh, with a star showing where Sausalito is located just inside the Golden Gate and uh, looking out onto uh, the bay. Uh, the picture in the middle shows um, the view looking south from the top of Mount Tam, so where the arrow is pointing here. So you can just see Sausalito over here to the left on what is what we call Richardson Bay, named after William Richardson, with the greater San Francisco Bay beyond. But I chose this picture because it just shows how hilly the terrain is, and Sausalito is really uh, sort of huddled here on the shore of the bay. Over the hills is quite a bit more open area. This is a picture taken from 1945, which shows the town, and then all of this open area that was, uh, as we'll see in a moment, uh, quite a few ranch, uh, dairy ranches in that area. Uh, the original Portuguese uh, who came here and landed in Sausalito were very likely uh, crew members on the, the New England whaling ships that would have started to come into the San Francisco Bay, oh, maybe around 1820, 1830. Um, they would have bypassed Sausalito. Nobody would have ever come to Sausalito because San Francisco, even at that time, was the population center but for the fact that Sausalito had excellent water and uh, timber supplies as well. And so when the whalers would come in, they would, of course, probably go to San Francisco, uh, but then they would also be sure to come and spend a little time in Sausalito, uh, replenishing their fresh water supplies and probably taking on some timber for uh, repairs uh, to the vessels. So it's very likely that the first Portuguese uh, came ashore right here in what we uh, call Whaler's Cove at the southern end of Sausalito. 
This is what it looks like uh, today. This obviously San Francisco in the background looking across the bay here. But back in the 1800s, when the Portuguese uh, would have come, this would have been roughly what it looked like, a very undeveloped uh, area. This is actually in the later 1800s. So when the, the whalers would have been here, there probably would have been almost no structures here along the beach. Sausalito really, uh, the fact that it became a relatively important place is due, of course, to location. You know, in real estate, it's location, location, location. And Sausalito had the advantage of being uh, both a ferry and a rail hub. The ferry is going across the bay starting in 1868, and then the rail service going north, actually all the way up to Sonoma County, starting in 1874. And Sausalito was right at the hub of those two transportation lines. This is a shot showing Sausalito down here. And this is the rail line that went up all along Tamales Bay, through Tamales, up into Sonoma, and up into Occidental. The primary reason for that was to be able to bring lumber uh, down uh, to be able to supply that uh, to the growing uh, San Francisco uh, market. And of course, then it also opened up the area along the rail line uh, for agricultural supplies to be, including dairy products, to be uh, sent into San Francisco. This is what Sausalito looked like in 1903. For those of you who've come here today, you won't recognize it. It doesn't look anything like this, but this is the rail yard and you can see the ferries uh, uh, moored here as well. And then this is another view showing the, the ferries starting in the uh, around 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1915 or so, they started to have auto ferries as well. And so in this picture, this area here, the ferry docks are the passenger ferries. And over here are the auto ferries. Of course, before this Golden Gate Bridge was built in 1937, the only way you could get from Sausalito to San Francisco was by ferry. And the only way you could get by here by car was to drive your car onto the auto ferry and come across uh, that way. But as you can see, Sausalito was a busy, noisy, dirty, probably relatively unpleasant place to live, uh, quite a bit different uh, than it is today. The organization that I'm involved with now is the IDESST, which uh, is an acronym for this organization that it was originally a brotherhood, the Irmandad, and so there were no women members in this organization until relatively uh, recently. But the IDESST was established here in Sausalito in 1888. So prior to that time, probably going back to the 1860s, the Portuguese population here began to grow until at this point in 1888, they'd reached a sufficiently critical mass that they were able to establish this organization. Uh, and actually, this was uh, five years before Sausalito was itself incorporated as a city. But our first president was this gentleman on the left, Mr. Bacherus, uh, who was a merchant. Um, and then later on in 1904, the organization actually formally incorporated um, and has existed then uh, continuously uh, ever since. Uh, this is a photo from 1888, actually, coincidentally, the very year the IDESST was established, looking north uh, across Richardson Bay. And this is the very first uh, hall, the uh, lodge of the IDESST that was completed in 1888. Uh, by the organization. So not only were they able to form, they, were, they had sufficient resources to be able to build you know, a fairly impressive structure. At that time, the only other real buildings in that part of Sausalito uh, was this church, the St. Mary's Star of the Sea Church in its original location, and the original Sausalito schoolhouse here. So if you went up this way, you'd get up to Mill Valley and then if you wanted to go to San Rafael, you'd have to go up this way. Just interesting to note that at, at this point, there was actually a railroad trestle that went across the, the bay, and that's what you can see uh, going across here. But this is a view of the, uh, the original uh, hall for the, uh, 
the IDESST. This is a shot from 1948, one of the Feshtas. And so the queens are coming down the stairs here. Uh, happily, the structure still remains today. A beautiful building um, on uh, Filbert Street here in Sausalito, uh, not too far away from our uh, current hall where we moved in uh, 1953. Uh, this is a view from the, the the porch of the the old hall and so as you can see just a lovely lovely location up on the hillside and thinking back to that original picture we saw from 1888 of course at that point there was nothing at all around the, this building uh, this is a picture of a banquet that was held in 1907 for a visiting vip from portugal so you can see everybody here lined up this was probably the the event of the season. And then this is a shot of the same room. That building, uh, the former hall is today a, uh, a Christian organization owns it. And so uh, you can see that it's set up as a, uh, with an altar in the front here in pews, but this is a relatively the same view in the two pictures. It's kind of amazing because it's not that big a building and yet they somehow managed to cram thousands of people in there, you know, for the festas and other events. Here we have our hall, which is down here in Sausalito, but there are a number of other um, halls, similar halls uh, in our area. And we have very close relationships with them when we have our festas, we coordinate the festas. So uh, we have them on different weekends and the queens from the different halls can participate in the different uh, festas. But of these, Nevado is also in Marin County. The others are in other uh, counties. Uh, and here's a view of the, the Feshta. And of course, one of the highlights is always the release of the, the Alva Pomba, the white uh, dove. Uh, and our, our, uh, because we are the oldest uh, hall in the area, we have the, the honor of still holding our Feshta on Pentecost Sunday, which is the traditional Sunday on which uh, to hold it. Uh, here's another view of uh, downtown Sausalito or Caledonia Street, where our hall is located today. This building was the building where the original Festa was held, and actually it was held in 1886, which was two years before the IDESST was established. This building was a saloon and general store, and then they would march down and up the hill. This is the close-up view of the St. Mary's Church that we saw uh, in the uh, one of the earlier slides. This is St. Mary's today. It's now in uh, its third location in Sausalito, but quite a beautiful church. This is the interior. And of course, there are some statuary there that has been donated by the Portuguese uh, community, a statue of Queen Isabel, and then one of um, uh, the Fatima, uh, Mary, St. Mother Mary of Fatima. And of course, uh, several of the, the windows in the church have been donated uh, by members uh, of the Portuguese community. So when you're there, you definitely feel like uh, Portugal is all around you. As Dennis said, in about seven years ago, 2014, when I just got started uh, with working on the history of the Portuguese uh, community here in uh, the Southern Marin, uh, we decided to create a walking tour to highlight uh, the um, some of the locations in Sausalito uh, where which had significant uh, connections uh, with the area's Portuguese uh, history. Uh, we weren't quite sure when we started that it was feasible, but then as we got into it, we said, well, of course, there's so many uh, points here uh, that where there, this history is resonating. So it turned out that it was actually rather easy to put together this, uh, this tour. Uh, and you can obtain a copy of this guidebook and learn more about the tour on the IDE SST um, website on our history page there and download a copy of the guidebook. But I would encourage you to take the tour, perhaps not the whole thing all in one, one fell swoop. I actually did walk it one time. It includes several sites here in Sausalito, but also a number out in Tennessee Valley and the Marin Headlands, and it's about a 13 mile walk from point one to point 33, which I did do one day. But since then, we've learned a lot more about the Portuguese uh, here in Sausalito, and this is just showing Caledonia Street, which is 
one of the main streets here in Sausalito. Our hall that you saw on the cover uh, as we started is down here. The original hall is up here on Filbert Street. But you can see here Caledonia Street that runs down here. These are all spots that we've identified that have significant contacts with the Portuguese history here in Sausalito, either former residents or former businesses and other activities. That uh, hall we saw in the earlier picture where the very first festa was held was here, the, the Lawrence or Lorenzo uh, family's uh, business right in the middle of Caledonia Street. And we are going to be starting to do walking tours of Caledonia Street through the IDESST uh, in the new year. So if you're interested, stay tuned for that. But um, getting into the subject of dairies, uh, dairies have always been a very important uh, part of the, the Portuguese community here in Southern Marin and the economic uh, uh, life of the, not only the Portuguese community, but the community of Marin as a whole. And this is just showing some of the, uh, the activities. Uh, if we had gone back 50 years to attend, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, to attend one of the festas, a few days before, you would have heard mooing on the streets of Sausalito as they would have brought their the cows that had been donated by farmers out in the countryside. They would round them up, and this may be going as far as Bolinas, but they would have round them up and driven them in on the roads into Sausalito and then driven them right through the center of town. This is the intersection of Pine Street and Caledonia that uh, structure you can see in the background is the Lorenzo General Store. And so that's where the very first uh, festa was held here in Sausalito. But as you can see, these cows are just heading south on Caledonia. And then the, the custom was to take them over to a corral that the IDESST had over in the northern part of Sausalito on Olima Street. And there uh, they would be, uh, some of them would be auctioned off to raise funds for the uh, uh, for the organization. And as you can see here, some would meet a less pleasant fate uh, for them anyway. Uh, but for those who enjoy sopash, um, that, uh, that, that was the, the main ingredient, of course, of the, the wonderful sopash uh, that is uh, served as the traditional lunch uh, for the festas. Uh, today, that corral that I mentioned is become a rotary senior housing area, uh, but just to retain a little bit of the Portuguese uh, tradition, the, uh, this structure here, which is the community's meeting room, uh, which was the old barn uh, and actually the slaughterhouse uh, for the, uh, the facility uh, has been turned into this uh, meeting room that they call the Shamachita. Uh, room. So it uh, has a plaque and it's a very pleasant spot. So we've done now quite a bit of research on the dairies uh, in uh, Southern Marin. And frankly, I've lived here 40 years. If you'd asked me 33 years ago how many dairies uh, there had been in Southern Marin, I would have said none. Uh, but since then, I've, uh, I've learned quite a bit more uh, and we've identified uh, uh, all of these dairies uh, that uh, were located uh, here, uh, going up uh, on the left here, if you go a little bit further up to Bolinas area, there were about 41, all of which uh, were owned by Portuguese. So um, we have here a list just showing uh, the various dairy locations and who some of the owners were, but these dairies were operating probably in many cases for 70 or 80 years. So several generations of families and others uh, would have cycled through here and very likely have gone on from Southern Marin to other parts of California. Probably uh, many of the dairy families that are operating today in the Central Valley Dennis would have uh, roots here in Sausalito or Marin County. Now, this is a, uh, an interesting list. I don't expect everybody to read it, but uh, in 1880, the census in 1880 showed uh, a group of dairy farmers who were operating 24 dairies, tenant dairies on property that they were leasing from a gentleman named Samuel Throckmorton. He would later sell those properties off. And as of 1926, the properties that were covered by that area were owned by uh, this list of people. 
So I'm not gonna show you which of these people were not Portuguese. So it's quite remarkable that, and we still are not able to explain exactly how this really incredible concentration uh, came about, uh, but it's, I'm afraid it may just be one of those subjects that is um, going to be a historical mystery, but uh, we'd certainly love to learn more about it. And as you can see, there were just so many Portuguese here. This is our, a few maps uh, showing the area. This uh, first one up here shows the, the red uh, border is uh, the Rancho Sausalito that uh, William Richardson uh, was granted in 1838, just under 20,000 acres. Uh, Samuel Throckmorton was William Richardson's lawyer. Uh, and you know what happens in some cases with lawyers and their clients. And we don't know all the details, but somehow by 1880, Samuel Throckmorton had come into, he then owned the area that is outlined in the yellow here, which it was about 15,000 acres. And at that point, he was leasing some parts of that property to those 24 tenant dairies that we referred to earlier. Parts of the property had also been sold off uh, to create the city of Sausalito that we know today. And then also this area down here had been sold to the army uh, for the military base, Fort Baker and Fort Berry. Um, but by 1925, uh, the area in green here was all owned by Portuguese. And you can see each of those cow icons shows the location of uh, one of the dairies. But by 1925, 41% of the original Rancho Sausalito was owned by Portuguese. And this is just another map showing some of the, the property that was sold off by uh, uh, the Throckmorton estate. Um, and the dairies that are located within its borders. Today, as I said with myself, I've lived here for decades, and but for the fact that I've gotten involved with this research, I would never have really appreciated uh, this dairy history. And I'm afraid that physically, there just is very little that remains today that uh, reminds us of the heritage. There are only, only two or three uh, physical locations where there is even a structure that remains. This is a, uh, a now a riding area, Miwok Stables in Tennessee Valley, just over the hill from us uh, here in Sausalito, uh, where some of the structures of the Lopes and the Cunha Dairy remains. And then out very close to Near Beach is this barn that belonged to what is was called the Golden Gate Dairy. Another today, that is another equestrian area but one that we're hoping we'll be able to use some part of for an interpretive center in the future. But uh, some of you may be familiar with this book, uh, Maria and the Lost Calf, which is a bilingual children's book that uh, has been put out by Portuguese press here. Uh, it was uh, written by Kate Moorjohn and illustrated by her husband, Dwight Moorjohn. Uh, and it's a story of a little girl who wants to go to the festa and she has a little calf. And in any case, you can see here that Dwight took his inspiration for the cover of the book from the hillside uh, there around the, uh, the Lopes uh, dairy uh, in Tennessee Valley. So with that, the work I had done on the, um, the dairies here in Southern Marin, the 40 some dairies that were owned by the Portuguese. I uh, then was fortunate to meet a fellow named Dewey Livingston, who was a historian in uh, West Marin, uh, who has done a lot of work on the dairies out in that area, many of which were of Swiss Italian origin, just as the Azorians came here to Southern Marin, a large group came from the Southern uh, uh, Swiss canton of Ticino to Marin, uh, Italian speaking canton. And so if you go up there, you'll run into a lot more Italian names. And almost all of those uh, were Swiss Italians uh, who came here around the same time uh, the Azorians uh, did. Uh, but Dewey and I have worked now to try and more broadly identify uh, dairy locations here in Marin. Uh, and we're now up to uh, about uh, uh, just short of 400. 
but as you can see, they were all over. Uh, and uh, we figured that there was about one dairy for every two square miles here in Marin. And early on in the late 1800s, Marin was really the dairy capital of California. It was supplying, and this is of course because of transportation issues, uh, lack of refrigeration and so forth, but it was really the main area of supply of dairy products. And a lot of that was of course butter, uh, which of course uh, traveled better, but also uh, fresh products, which could be transported by train and then by ferry uh, into San Francisco. Today, uh, unfortunately, the has been quite a decline in the number of dairies uh, over the years, uh, probably from a high point in the early 1900s. Um, today, there are only about 20 uh, cow's milk dairies that are still in remaining in operation in Marin County. And almost all of those are up in the, uh, the northwest corner of the county, up in the Tamales and Point Reyes area. And of course, they're under a lot of pressure too. Many of them have tried to diversify into cheese production to uh, develop an additional uh, source of revenue. But as I think, as we all know, cow's milk is under pressure from lots of different uh, directions. So I, I just wanted to say a little bit more too about the Portuguese population here in Marin. Sometimes I get so caught up in discussing dairies. It sounds like everybody was a farmer and of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, this is the inaugural issue of the, the Sausalito News, which was the primary newspaper here in Sausalito starting in 1885. And I just went through it and cut out the, a few of the ads for uh, that appeared in that inaugural issue. So these would have been some of the more established businesses uh, in Sausalito at that time. And as you can see, Diaz and Silva, Santos and companies at the, the Lisbon Hotel, the Mancebo and Cordoza at the Tamalpais Stables, and then the Silva's Restaurant and Saloon. So there was a very substantial business uh, community that was already built up at that time. And then, of course, uh, the civic involvement. Um, Sausalito was, have, was very fortunate to have a number of our Portuguese Americans who have played active roles uh, in the city government uh, here in Sausalito. These are some of the folks who have either served as trustee, the council members uh, here, or as uh, city officers. Um, and then there were other, uh, this is an interesting article from 1904, uh, reporting on the establishment of a new political club for Marin that was made up of Portuguese Americans, including Manuel Freitas, who was the founder of the Portuguese bank here, very prominent, maybe the most prominent uh, Portuguese American here in Marin County, originally got his start in San Francisco and then moved out to San Rafael, but also as part of this group were Jose Silva and Antonio Nunes Bello, who were two very prominent uh, folks here in Sausalito. And then uh, just a little bit of our maritime history as well. 1924, uh, uh, three brothers, the Nunish brothers, who had been born in Santo Amaru on the island of Piku, uh, moved their boat building facility from Oakland uh, over here to uh, the, actually to Whaler's Cove, uh, right where we saw the original Portuguese would have landed here in Sausalito and went into the boat building business. And for oh, the next uh, 50 years, they were prolific boat builders uh, here. Uh, both commercial vessels, fishing boats, and uh, uh, other power vessels, but also their, their most famous boat was one that was called the Zaka, a uh, 114-foot schooner that was uh, commissioned by a banker named Templeton Crocker in the midst of the Depression, built right in the streets of Sausalito. It was too big to fit in the Nunes Brothers' uh, boatyard, so they had to build it out in the street. It was launched and then subsequently uh, owned by Errol Flynn. Uh, there are many, many stories of the Zaka happily is still cruising today uh, in the Mediterranean. But the Nunes brothers also built many other sailing ships, which uh, have a lot of uh, the romance of the Sausalito uh, sailing um, culture. Uh, two of the most famous classes are their bear class and their mercury class. But this was their boat yard, which was right down on the shore there on Richardson 
Bay uh, along 2nd Street. In uh, 2016, Manuel Nunes, the older of the Nunes brothers, was honored by the Azorian government uh, with uh, their Medal of uh, Professional Merit. And one of uh, his uh, descendants had an opportunity to go over to San Miguel uh, for the ceremony. And so today, as uh, Dennis mentioned, we try to do weekly uh, posts uh, here on our the Facebook page for the IDESST to keep the history alive. This is just a sample of some of the more recent ones we've done. Tony Freitas, maybe Marin's most famous uh, baseball player, a story about uh, our uh, Sausalito or the Lusitania Band of the North Bay, kind of keeping the tradition of the Portuguese marching bands going. Uh, the, a, a Little Reed Ranch over in Tiburon. Uh, this is Tiburon Boulevard. For those of you who know Tiburon, uh, uh, you wouldn't recognize uh, this location today, but that's where uh, uh, the Little Reed Ranch was located. We're actually hoping to be able to install a mural, an azulejos uh, mural here uh, to honor the Portuguese heritage of the area in the near future. And then the uh, Panama Pacific International Exposition, for those of you who've been to our plaza downtown, which is actually the Plaza Viña del Mar, uh, named after our very first sister city in Chile. Uh, this is one of the elephants in the Plaza Viña del Mar, which originally, actually, the, uh, this is a replica of the original one that was uh, in uh, at the Panama Pacific International Exposition. And the tie-in to Portugal and San Jose is that the Five Wounds uh, Church in um, San Jose, many of the timbers came from the Portuguese pavilion that was at the Panama Pacific International Exposition. This is the, the Five Wounds Church there in San Jose. So those of you who are interested in learning more about the history, uh, you can take a look at some of these posts on our Facebook page. We'll have one tomorrow morning about Tony Madeiras, who was the only uh, Portuguese American postmaster here in Sausalito. We're fortunate uh, too to have um, several historical societies uh, here in, uh, in Marin. And so one of the things that we try to do through the IDESST is to cooperate and collaborate with those organizations to to be able to share uh, and in many cases highlight to them some of the Portuguese history that is uh, uh, in their areas. Uh, we've been, uh, they're very eager to learn about that and we're very eager uh, to share that history. Uh, needless to say, our main uh, connection is with the Sausalito Historical Society. They've been just really great uh, partners uh, for us at the IDESST. Uh, this is a group of them marching in our Festa, uh, the Espirito Santo Parade. Uh, we cooperate with them. This is me and my sidekick uh, appearing uh, one of their programs in the Sausalito uh, classrooms uh, to try to present local history. I was there uh, to present some in history about the Portuguese, both Mr. Silva, who is uh, one of our eminent uh, uh, Portuguese Americans here in Sausalito, and then uh, on the structure side, some of the buildings uh, here in Sausalito. Uh, we also, I also get around, uh, as Dina said, to some of the local schools, uh, ideally with some cheese and sweet bread in hand. Uh, uh, we've uh, given them an opportunity, the kids, an opportunity to learn a little bit more about uh, uh, Portuguese uh, history. It's interesting that uh, so many of the schools here in Southern Marin are on the sites of local dairies. Every one of these stars here shows one of our elementary schools that is also on the site of our local dairy. Dinesh, I don't know if they have any connection with the Borges dairy over here in Tennessee Valley, but uh, we have one named after you. <laughs> Probably not, but uh, <laughs> we're, we might be related somehow with the name. Yes, that gorgeous family is from South George. I should have said earlier too that um, although we have uh, representatives from probably every one of the Azorean islands and Madeira uh, here as well, uh, a very significant uh, percentage of the population, certainly early on 
uh, looking back to that uh, group that we looked at in the 1880s uh, on the the um, the Throckmorton uh, properties, um, uh, a very large percentage came from South George, maybe as high as 70 percent. And we've never quite been able to figure out, of course, probably somebody comes and sends back a note and the next person comes and they send back two notes and then four notes and it probably goes from there. But uh, if you run into a Portuguese here uh, in Southern Marin, it's more likely than not that they will have come from São Jorge. But today I'm looking forward, our, our most significant connection is not only with the Azores, but with Cascais, our new sister city uh, in Portugal, which is uh, for those of you who've had the opportunity to be there, just one of the most lovely cities that you can imagine. It's just, here's Lisbon here on the Teju River. And as you go out and if you hang a right, uh, first uh, place you come to would be uh, Cascais. So like Sausalito, it has a kind of a maritime sailing uh, tradition uh, about, uh, it's a little bit bigger of course, but it's a, uh, has a lot, a lot of similarities and it's been just a wonderful uh, connection for, for us. Uh, this effort to create the sister city started back in 2012 when a group uh, from the IDESST led by our then uh, president Vasco Moraes, um, a delegation went to Qashqais to, um, uh, they were invited and they participated in the Qashqais uh, um, a meeting they had uh, celebrating their various sister city relationships. They have a number of different sister cities around the world, uh, but the Sausalito delegation had the chance to participate. And then the following year, um, a delegation came from Qashqais and at the time of our festa, uh, and this was the parade for the festa. We had a signature ceremony at the, the, the plaza, uh, the Viña del Mar Plaza, uh, and they signed the sister city uh, uh, agreement at that time. And it's gone on from there. Uh, one of the annual, at least until the pandemic hit, the annual events was a youth exchange where uh, kids would go back and forth and be involved with the sailing programs in the two cities. Um, as part of that, we've also sponsored Fadu Nights uh, here, which have been tremendously uh, popular. Uh, David Garcia and others uh, of our local Fadistas have had the chance to participate. Um, it's just been great. And then more recently, uh, back in 2018, Kashkaish was kind enough to send us 13 tons of rocks, <laughs> uh, which uh, we, from which there were four different colors from four quarries uh, in Portugal. Uh, here they are on arrival. Uh, we took this somewhat nondescript uh, plaza in front of the Bank of America, what was then the Bank of America building, along Bridgeway in downtown, did a little bit of preparatory work. Uh, not only did Qashqais send us 13 tons of rocks, even more importantly, they sent us two calceteros, which are their the professional installers of calzadas, which are these uh, these mosaics, these stone mosaics. And they, uh, as you saw from the earlier photo, Cascais and other Portuguese cities have these beautiful uh, public areas uh, where they have these stone mosaics, the calzadas. And so they actually have in their municipal staffs, folks who are adept at installing and maintaining them. And we were very fortunate to have two of the nicest guys, Marcos Paulino and Luis Santinho, who came from Cascais and within a matter of weeks had taken a pile of rocks and had created this beautiful Rosa dos Ventos, uh, Rose of the Winds, uh, Compass Rose uh, emblem here, uh, made out of these four colors of rock. Uh, and they took, it's, I, I really should have a video of this, but Every one of those stones was individually picked up by either Luis or Marcos. Uh, they examined it, took a few whacks on it with their hammer, maybe took a few more whacks, put it in place, picked it up, put it down, and then uh, went on to the next rock. So each one of these stones was individually installed. 
And then uh, it's kind of the more uh, ceremonial part of the, the event in uh, June of two, 2018, the Prime Minister Costa uh, came and with um, uh, some dignitaries from Kashkaish and, and others, we had a lovely uh, ceremony to dedicate uh, the plaza. Um, and today, here it is, this is looking across Bridgeway and you can see the, the plaza here uh, with the bay uh, beyond. And not only is it a beautiful um, public work here in Sausalito that is so emblematic of Portuguese culture and tradition, um, and what could be more emblematic than the navigation uh, symbol of the compass rose, uh, but it's located directly across the street from what at least I call Portuguese row. I remember Mr. Bajeros was our first president. Well, this was his building directly across the street from the Praça de Cascais. And then just down the street here, probably right about here, was where that Lisbon house, one of the early boarding houses was located. So it's just a, uh, just a wonderful thing to, for us to have here in Sausalito, us to be able to share with the visitors and uh, we're so uh, so very fortunate that uh, Kashka, for the generosity of Kashkaish to have been able to to install this. Now I should just say in closing, um, seven or eight years ago I knew nothing about Portugal, um, and although I knew about the Portuguese center here in Sausalito, uh, I have to say that even though I had a little bit of a leg up because of my awareness of Portuguese culture from growing up in Hawaii. Uh, so many people who are who are Portuguese and who were members of the center were so, so helpful and welcoming uh, to me. And that's obviously been something that's been very meaningful to me that I've benefited from. And I just wanted to thank two of them who actually that are uh, some of you may know as uh, correspondents or columnists for the Tribuna Portuguesa. Margarida da Silva, uh, who is from Santo Amaro, just like the Nunes brothers, uh, and Jose Raposo, I believe, is from San Miguel. I should know this, but uh, both uh, Margarida and actually her brother in law, Jose, um, are just wonderful, wonderful folks. And it's kind of just thinking as well, we've been very fortunate not only to have that original wave of uh, Portuguese immigrants who came in the, starting in the 1880s but also the newer uh, wave of immigrants who came in the 50s and 60s following uh, the Capuinus uh, volcano and the uh, 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 additional opportunities for immigration at that time. So thank you, Margarita and Jose, if you're on, uh, I really appreciate it. And so many others who've helped me. So uh, I do thank you, Dinas, for this opportunity. Um, and thanks to everybody who's participated in the program. I really do love to hear from people and particularly from anybody who thinks they may have connections with Sausalito. We love to be able to try to identify those connections and to help people uh, trace their roots here. People are interested in coming to Sausalito. I'm always happy to, uh, to help in terms of suggesting uh, things to visit as well. So you can reach me here at this, my uh, email address uh, at the IDESST History Committee. So, obrigado. Thank you, obrigado, Mike. Thank you so much. Uh, that was fascinating, and we are not, you're not off the hook yet. We need, uh, we have some, <laughs> we have some questions here, but I'm going to ask you to, if you can stop the share part, um, that way folks can look at, it, at you a little bit better. There you go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, there, there's a, first of all, thank you so much. Fascinating. I learned a lot. I took a lot of notes. Um, and, uh, and your thought about, you know, of course, uh, why, you know, uh, 70% or so from St. George, it's exactly what, like you said, you know, there's a, a letter went home, you know, to tell mom and dad or, uh, your uncle or your aunt, uh, how things were in America, where you were at. And then all of a sudden people come to the area and that, uh, you're established. And again, as, as early as you said that some of the Portuguese came and established themselves from the whaling uh, uh, institutions, São Jorge and Pico had a, uh, and Flores for that matter as well, all islands in the Azores, but it's certainly São Jorge 
and Piku and Flourish had a very, very strong presence of the early whalers that, uh, that uh, got on ships and some of them made their way into California and others into other parts of the United States. Um, the first question that we have is actually a question that's also here that uh, our friend uh, Carol Gregory put on, and I appreciate that from Carol. Um, Carol is a geographer who's done an outstanding job in mapping out different places in California. There are Portuguese background. Her uh, dissertation, her uh, PhD dissertation is about that, and we hope to have it. Um, uh, we, have to ha we hope to have it um, uh, actually published uh, in a book format uh, as part of our new publishing a house at uh, Fresno State Bruma Publications. But her question is, but basically how much effort has uh, was taken into preparing the walking tour brochure um, of the Portuguese sites in Sao Salido? In particular, how was this effort funded? And uh, and she adds with a comment, which I uh, wholeheartedly agree. I had that down as well. Um, this would be a great project for many other Portuguese communities in California, um, even uh, if not as a walking tour, as a as a possibility to look. I mean, I just through oral history, I've been finding all kinds of things about the Portuguese in the Central Valley, and it's important to have these things um, uh, recognized. And uh, and and kudos to you and all of your uh, the folks who worked with you on this walking tour. So, in, in essence, to Carol's question, how was it? How much of an effort was it? I'm sure it was a daunting effort in the beginning. And uh, how does one get it funded? Uh, uh, how? What was the process that you took there? Uh, we just did it. <laughs> well, that's the best way. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> we actually did. There wasn't any funding involved. Uh, we, of course, had the support of the Historical Society. Uh, and so we had access to their records and resources. And of course, as I said, I was so fortunate you know, I, I think in part, uh, one of the benefits, and I, I don't mean to sort of make this about myself, but in a little Please bit, do. I, I was kind of, you deserve outsider, it. I was an outsider uh -huh. to this um, whole thing. I mean, I was starting literally from ground zero, um, I, I, both in terms of Sausalito history, which I've come to learn a lot more about, but I had retired. And before that, I'd had actually very, I have to admit, very little to do with the local matters here in Sausalito. When I retired, I then had a tremendous amount more time. And I really found, I, I was trained as a historian way, 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 way back when. I was a Japanese history major in college. Um, so I really enjoy history. But I think being an outsider, being interested in, uh, in Portugal, um, and I think in part, it, it, it struck me that the, the treatment of the Portuguese here and kind of our local history had been a little bit too shallow because it didn't really reflect the true, you know, com, um, the true uh, uh, contributions that had been made in so many different levels. I don't think there was anything um, uh, intentional necessarily mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that, but mm -hmm. you, know, you pick up what is the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, it's often, you know, more difficult to get people to share. Uh, but I was very fortunate, and I had some of the folks that I mentioned during the talk who were very happy, to, easy, happy to share with me. Plus, it was a, it was like being in the, you know, the Sierra foothills at the time of the gold rush. You could just walk around and pick up nuggets. There was there was very little actual digging that that really needed to be done because all of this was sort of available if you knew if you if you were looking for it um and uh, as i say that uh, that was really if it had been hard i probably wouldn't have done it <laughs> oh i'm sure it was hard but it was um, but it was doable and and it was a lot of fun too yeah, well and you made a very good point that i uh, that those who are following us whether you're following us here on the webinar or thanks to all the nice comments that we're getting from uh, facebook live as well um the you made a very a very uh, straightforward point that's very important for us to remember. Sometimes it does take an outsider because um, when we are in the Portuguese community, we're kind of, uh, some folks in the Portuguese community are very entrenched in the societies and they work very hard, you know, to putting together the festas and everything else. And they go from festa to festa to festa, you know, doing the fundraisers and everything else. And sometimes it takes someone from the outside to look at it and say, but we do need to establish this 
or else all of this gets lost. And you're absolutely right. Same thing happens, and I can use here some of the Valley towns, especially even the town I live in, the Portuguese in Tulare County. We've been here again since the 18, in large numbers since the 1860s, but before that. And um, and, and and when we look at the Tulare Historical Society, um, there's not a lot in the Portuguese. And basically because... Um, they do the best they can. It's not because they're anti anybody. It's because sometimes there isn't the manpower uh, or the interest in it. And I think that we in the Portuguese American community, those of you who are following us who are of uh, Portuguese background and want to get involved, these local historical societies, and as you pointed out, Mike, in South Salido, they do a wonderful job but they also have limited resources and they are always looking for volunteers. So, and that is one way to bring into those historical societies, a Portuguese connection, let's put it that way, or someone who's interested in the Portuguese uh, okay. presence. I might, I'd say to a lot, much of it is, for example, here in, in our area, the historical societies are necessarily, I won't call them silos, but they're, they're focused on their immediate area. Sure. And the, the history of the Portuguese community here is broader than that. And at least here in Southern Marin, we're probably going across five or six different historical societies. And so a lot of what I found was that it was a matter, I often viewed my role simply as unearthing things and then aggregating mm -hmm. you know, them, because often the historical societies would not be necessarily communicating with each other about these issues that cross the borders between the physical borders between the different communities. And so, you know, I, I really have to commend you on your efforts regarding oral histories because those were maybe the most important uh, resource that, that I found as an outsider coming in because of course they give you such tremendous access. Um, and, you know, I'm, I don't mind asking dumb questions and I've, I've asked more than my share. And actually that's another benefit of being an outsider is that you don't have to, really be embarrassed by that. But uh, oral histories have just been so incredibly helpful. And those were things that we were able to identify in different different pockets here and there, and then to, to really bring to light uh, in a more, uh, presenting them in a more cohesive and coordinated fashion. Indeed, indeed. Um, um, we're trying the best we can. We had a pandemic here in the middle, but we're hoping to uh, literally uh, bring that to a forefront in the next few months. There's a, a actually a request, and I think we can probably get uh, this person who would like to have a, a screenshot of the slide that you had with the windows uh, from the star of the sea church. Oh, so sure. um, maybe uh, we can, if they, if that person can get us their email, I can shoot it to you and you can send it to them. So if you don't mind uh, putting your email there on the chat or just send it to me, uh, actually, I'll do that. I'll just put my email here and that way you can do that. So I'll put my email in just a little bit. Uh, but I, as, as Mike answers this question, um, there's another question that, uh, and, and there's a little bit of a commentary that I'd like to read, which is, uh, again, thank you so much for the presentation. Do you have any suggestions for other cultural heritage organizations? I grew up in Southern Marin and remember the Little Reed Dairy, and now live in Kona uh, among many families from the Azores, Camara, Teixeira, Silva, Gouveia, etc. cetera. Um, and this uh, has been so special to learn more about the Portuguese heritage in South Salido. Uh, I'm on the board of a heritage uh, preservation organization here. We hope to develop walking tours and a multicultural heritage festival. Kudos to you for doing that. So we don't forget. Um, so, uh, if, if, what is your uh, what is what is your suggestions for other cultural organizations um, uh, to, uh, to 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 basically do this kind of work? I think you've already answered a little bit to that question. But. Well, I always think that food is a good hook. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> I love food and I love to eat and I love to explore and learn the origins. Of, and that, of course, what could be better? For, what could be a better culture than the Portuguese for uh, having food be this just tremendous vehicle, you know, for uh, learning more, more about it? Um, but certainly, I think that's that's one way that uh, we do it here. You know, the IDESST today, our membership is probably I'd have I'd have to guess at least as many non-Portuguese as Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have 
I have, I'm an, of Irish descent myself. And so I guess I'm a wannabe. I have Portuguese envy. Dennis. We have some, we have a lot of, uh, <laughs> we have, I have a very good friend of mine who's also an attorney and who's, a, and who's Irish. And we, I said, we have a lot of, uh, Good th- a lot of things in common. And he says, yes, you do, except he, sa- he tells me your food is better. I'm not going to comment there, but he says uh, yes, the I Portuguese. Learned, I learned that there is a gaitash. Is that the, the, the bagpipes? Of Northern yes, Portugal? yes, we do. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. The gaitash. That's right. Very, very famous in certain parts of Portugal. Um, but, uh, but I, I think that, you know, what we try to do is make, uh, you're always trying to get people interested, of course. And I, I think that history but I, obviously everybody finds food or um, that. And of course, now we have this with Kashkaish, we not only are able to sort of suggest that people learn about the Azores through us, but Portugal, mainland Portugal is also a tremendously popular uh, destination. And so, um, you know, we try to hold ourselves out as being able to help people learn more about, uh, you know, how to, have a, how to have a great trip if they're gonna go to Portugal and then, when they come back to encourage them to, you know, to get involved uh, with our, us as well. Uh, indeed. And there's a couple of questions as far as recordings of this. Yes. Uh, so we have all record all of our sessions and they will be available starting actually tomorrow morning um, if, on YouTube. So just go to YouTube and type in Fresno State PBBI. That's all you have to do. Fresno State PBBI. And uh, we will have rec- actually uh, this presentation already up tomorrow morning sometime. Uh, and we promote it, of course, through social media. So uh, just go to Fresno State PBBI and we'll be more than happy to um uh, you, you'll see this one and the other 200 and some uh, presentations, workshops, poetry readings, all kinds of things that we have, most of them in English, about 70% of them in English, about 30% of them in Portuguese. So we have lots of things, but uh, the... If I could, Dennis, if I could put a plug in for our language program too. Please do. I've learned a little Portuguese, but we have an excellent Zoom Portuguese language program now at the IDSST as well. Indeed, and those are very important. Uh, it's uh, you learn Portuguese language and and you learn uh, history and 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 and, and, and of course um, uh, the the connection. So those are and kudos uh, to the uh, IDESST. Uh, to it has a few more S's than some of the other IDESs. And that is wonderful. And I'd like to explain that to people because so it's Irmandade do Espírito Santo e Santíssima Trindade. And so it, it, there are two in the Azores, there are two big days of festas, which are called Bodus, B-O-D-O-S. And the two Bodus are on, um, on Holy Ghost, uh, on Pentecost Sunday, what we call Pentecost Sunday, which is, we call it in the Azores, Domingo do Espírito Santo. And that's where the IDS has come from. As you mentioned, there were, all, there were lodges, or there was a lodge, IDS, Mandado Divino Espírito Santo, that then had different... Um, there were brotherhoods that did that different chapters, such as the one in Sausalito, uh, but they all have their different nuances, and it's just great. Of course, Tony <laughs> Goulart's book, the the, of the on the festers of the Holy Ghost uh, Spirit, is a is a must have, um, and uh, and uh, Tony Goulart and Jose Rodriguez and the entire uh, team on the uh, Portuguese Heritage Publications of California have done a tremendous job. I don't know what, where we would be without their work of the last 20 plus years. And so um, kudos to them. But the, um, the, 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 then, it, uh, the, then this hall has that IDS, Irmandade do Divino Espírito Santo, but then it has Santíssima Trindade, which is the second Sunday, which is Trinity Sunday, the second Sunday of the Bodu, because quite the contrary, of what the festers are here in the United States of America, um, there the seven Sundays, the Sundays between uh, between the uh, Easter and Pentecost Sunday, these celebrations are in people's homes. They're the idea of the promessa or a promise, and uh, then they become, of course, a part of the celebrations. So uh, uh, I, it's interesting. Yeah, this yeah, idea I, I, I it. back in the original, uh, the early days, and I probably I would say until the thirties at least. The IDESSD had two separate festas, one on uh, Pentecost Sunday and the second on Trinity Sunday. So folks would come in from the countryside and they would actually, we saw that how the hall was off in the middle of kind of an open area. People would camp out and spend the week in between here in Sausalito uh, and then be able to celebrate. Of course, the, the folks who were actually milking the cows would have to 
probably go back. Of course, the cows don't don't wait to be milked, but the families would come in and stay. Indeed, and that's so interesting. That so they would have both celebrations. Right. So we'd have two, we'd have two well two queens. You know, one for each weekend. Fantastic. Why not? I mean, the more the merrier. At that time, it was probably easier than it is today. Today's has been a little bit. We we ran through some issues in California of having some fishes that not having girls interested in being queens, but now that's being brought back again. It's all cyclical. Um, and so, thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it very, very much. Thank you all of you who are joining us here. Uh, for, and thanks for all the nice comments. Um, and thanks to all of you who are joining us as well on Facebook Live. Another presentation of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, PVBI at Fresno State. Thank you, Mike. Hopefully in about a year, we can have you in person at Fresno State uh, as part of, some, of, a, of a panel that we'd like to have on the Portuguese presence in different parts of the, of the, of the state. And uh, to those of you following us, um, one very, very quick uh, bit of information, which is that uh, we uh, also uh, begin. But first and foremost, Mike, thank you very much uh, for doing this and for uh, having this available uh, to many folks through, of course, our YouTube channel and part of the uh, Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute. This, uh, this talk, as all of others, uh, all of the others, I should say, are part of the collection that we have at the uh, Henry Madden Library as part of the PVBI Oral History Collection. So thank you all very, very much.